Hi, this is Stephen Sloan. The date is October 22nd, 2011. I'm with Mr. Herman Hank Josephs at his home at 146 uh, Rossiter in Corpus Christi, Texas. This is an interview for the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission's Texas Liberators Project. Thank you, Mr. Josephs, for sitting down with me to visit uh, today. It's a pleasure remembering it's so sad that if we don't remember it, we'll forget it. Yes, sir. So, I remember the Holocaust, which means remembrance. So we, we remember the indignity suffered by so many different peoples, and deaths and starvation and beatings and sur surgical surgical instances. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to remember and this will help others remember as you share your memories and I know you've been doing that with your family. So this is doing it in a larger sense with others. Well I have a confession to make. The first 40 years I was married I didn't say a word about it. It was too horrible to dredge up my memory but then I in uh, 2001, I wrote my autobiography so my kids would know what their father had gone through. And I have four children, a boy and three girls. And so I want them to know what I thought, where I was, where I've been, my situation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that they would know. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, I'd like to start out, if I could, at the beginning. I know you were born in San Antonio in 1925, but if you could tell me a little bit about the Josephs family, your family background, and that sort of thing. Well, oddly enough, my father was so overwhelmed by the fact that, he, that his wife had had twins, a boy and a girl. I was the boy, and my twin sister was a beautiful girl. She's not extant at the moment, God bless her. But she married a wonderful guy. My mother came with her four siblings to the United States <clears throat> in 1922. And uh, I helped them celebrate their 50th anniversary here in this country at the St. Anthony Hotel in San Antonio. So, I had a bunch of uncles and aunts and I admired them all. They pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and were very successful. My father was in the dry goods business and uh, had a hard time making a living, but he believed in going where the money was. So he came, he came to first to Ingleside, then Refurio, then Kilgore, Texas, and then Corpus Christi to the uh, Saxon field, which is Texas spelled backwards. So he came where the oil was because that's where the money was. And he, we never missed a meal. And I'm very grateful. I had a wonderful father, a wonderful mother. I was very fortunate. My father was an incurable romantic as I am and my mother was a businesswoman. She loved business, and she was very successful. She paid her bills on the first of the month like a clock, and she had been in charge of their grocery store in Zhytomyr, which is near Kiev in Ukraine in Russia, and uh, she was 12 years old when everybody else was out playing or going to synagogue, she was working. So my, that was my mother's benefit of life, was that she was the manager of their little grocery store that they had where people were so poor, used to come in and they used to buy one kopeck of butter or a piece of bread. A kopeck's like a penny. So when she married my dad, who was very romantic. They had met at a synagogue 
picnic and uh, they fell in love and he wrote her poetry in Romanian. He was from Bucharest, Romania. His name was Yosefovich originally and uh, wrote her poetry in Romanian, sang to her and eventually married her and uh, I'm a product of that, uh, I'm, a, I'm a progeny of that marriage, mm -hmm. luckily. I'm lucky he had a, a well-educated father, he loved to read, read all of the romantic writers of his time and uh, that didn't prepare me for World War II. Yeah. So when I was 16 years old, I started college. So I'd had two years of college by the time I was drafted at age 18. And uh, first thing I knew, I was sent overseas. You know, after three months in the service, I, I was not prepared for what faced me. But uh, all I knew was I shall not kill. And uh, they stuck a rifle in my hand and said, Thou shalt kill thy enemy. So we went to an unknown en enemy and we killed them. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, you, uh, do you know why your parents immigrated from? Well, my mother immigrated from Russia because of the senseless slaughter which the Russians put on the Jews. It was uh, bad to be Jewish in a Catholic country. So they had to get out of Russia. So they left in 1922. Mm -hmm. My mother and her mother and her two sisters and brother left Russia and uh, came to Warsaw. From Warsaw they came to Brest in France, took a boat to Galveston, no, not Galveston, Ellis Island. <clears throat> and they came in the United States through Ellis Island. Give me your poor, your hungry. And uh, it was a new world for them. And uh, my uncle had come here 12 years before, Uncle, uncle Aaron. And he had a house for them when they got here. He'd been here 12 years, had a house for them, stocked with linens and canned goods. And uh, that's a really benevolent son. He was a wonderful man, one of my idols mm. as I grew up, Uncle Aaron. Mm. Well, I know you, you probably have memories of the Depression. How did your family do? during the Depression? Well, fortunately we had a good contact with Uncle Aaron who had made money. He was in the finance business on De La Rosa Street in San Antonio. And uh, Dad borrowed money from him to start, to start a, a dry goods store in Furio, Texas, which was swimming in a puddle of oil, so they were, they did pretty well during the Depression. Mm -hmm. They followed the oil. Well, I th as you mentioned, the places that you lived, Kilgore, of course, ending up in Corpus, they were following the oil, where the oil money was. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. During the Depression, mm -hmm. we always had uh, pork chops and sweet and potatoes and meringue, lemon meringue pie for dinner. So we never starved to death. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, uh, my sister and I were twins and uh, the superintendent of the school there in Kilgore said pick out a, a boy and a, a boy, two kids from your class, such as a third grade teacher. and. Uh, I'm going to put them in the third grade. There are too many people in the second grade. So he, she picked me and another little girl named Marguerite. I'll never forget. Marguerite, pretty little girl. 
and I guess I answered all the questions. So I was always a grade ahead of my sister, and I don't think she was nervous. She was jealous. I don't think, but I wonder sometimes. But she had her friends, and I had my friends. Uh -huh. When I was 13 years old, my father suddenly announced, I'm going to have to have my leg amputated because I think he had uh, sugar diabetes and he smoked too much and didn't take care of himself. He had a leg amputated, so that made me the, the driver of the car. So I became, at 13, I became uh, a danger to the populace driving a car because I was hell on wheels. What was the family car in 1938? It was a 30, 36 Ford B8. And uh, never forget the song, Oh, give me a date in a Ford V8, rumble seat for two, and I'll make wahoo, wahoo, wahoo. That was a hundred years ago. <laughs> but I felt pretty responsible. I took my mother and father to work every day and uh, took them there and they opened the store at eight o'clock, stayed till six, had to take them and pick them up. And uh, that was my duty. And go to school and uh, make good grades. Were you a good student? I was a smart student, a good student. Lazy a little bit, but a pretty good student. I was on the track team at Miller High School, which was the only high school in town at the time. So I was on the track team. I ran pretty fast. Did everything pretty fast. You had a lot of independence for a 13 year old to have the use of the car and everything like that. Yeah, I never had a wreck. I made other people have wrecks, but I didn't have a wreck. I dodged in and out of traffic. I was pretty pretty fast. I enjoyed the power. Well, you uh, you mentioned uh, going to college at sixteen. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I uh, joined a fraternity. They came a rush party to Corpus Christi, and a bunch of guys from various cities in, in Texas came and rushed us to join their fraternity, which was Alpha Epsilon Pi. So I became an A.E. Pi, and that gave me instant recognition into society. And uh, what do we have? I think we've got a loose door back there. You, you might go and shut that up. Yeah, Robert DeBoard is with us here. He's our videographer and he's our door shutter, so he's going to go shut that door for us. So you rush this return. Now, what what college? University of Texas okay. at Austin. Okay. And I was an NAE Pi and uh, met lots, lots of girls, which was my want at age of 16, 17. Uh, I found a beautiful little girl from Dallas. Her name was Jackie LeSueur, and fell in love with her naturally. And uh, we were in love with each other. Went dancing on the drag, and every night, until I finally received a letter from uh, Uncle Sam saying, You're, you are hereby drafted, having reached the age of 18. Mm -hmm. So I'd had a, I was a, student prince for two years, year and a half, till I was drafted into the service. Had, had you followed much of the war or had your family kind of paid attention to what the was war going was on a, the, war, the war was a million miles away. Could have been on the moon, but we didn't hear much about it. Wasn't in the paper much, and we really didn't care much. We had a very carefree life. I worked every Saturday for an Army Navy store, made a, made a dollar an hour, which was a lot of money then. I'd make $15 over a weekend, working Saturday and Sunday. 
enough for to pay for my cleaning bill and a coke date with my girlfriend. But uh, those were the days, really glorious, carefree. So what, how did you feel when you were drafted? <laughs> I think I know the answer to this, but what was your reaction well, when I you was were felt, I f was felt that I was really put upon by the government. I felt that it was so, so unfair, my being taken away, away from my uh, panacea, my, uh, my lovely, my lovely campus and I didn't care so much about the studies. My favorite course was geology, which I enjoyed very much because it taught me a whole bunch. I learned all about cumulonimbus and uh, so on and so forth, but it, it's, it's the days after all these years, my college education. Mm -hmm. But as I said, I, I write my daughters a letter a week Cursive. I don't curse too much, but when my first child was born, I promised myself I would no longer use curse words. And we use a lot of them in the service. I would imagine, yeah. Some kids from New Jersey, they, they, every second word was a curse word. Well, it was a new, a new thing for me. Well, let, take me through induction and, and, and all that, kind of your early experience when you, because you, you, I mean, you weren't in ROTC or anything like that. So no, this so is nothing your, like this that. This is your first exposure <clears throat> to the military, so. I was uh, inducted at Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, 1944, in uh, February, and uh, was sent to Camp Maxey up near Weatherford, Texas, and uh, went through basic training there, six weeks basic, and we shipped over to uh, England, Liverpool, landed in Liverpool, England, and uh, we were training to invade Normandy. We didn't know it, but we were, mm -hmm. and uh, we trained, and it was so cold there, it would freeze your, your head off, uh, up in up in uh, Liverpool, near Liverpool, Nottingham was where we were, and the wind just whistled through those tents like there was nothing nothing there, and there was a little stove in the center of the tent. It was an eight-man tent, and uh, the, the wind just whistled through there, and there was a charcoal fire going, but that didn't help much. Couldn't take a shower because the showers were outside and it was cold, 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 as only England can get cold. That's what I said then. Of course, it was colder in Belgium. So from England, we, uh, we took off for Bournemouth after a couple of months of training there and we boarded the ship and on June the 5th, 1944, we boarded the ship and took off for the French coast and we landed and invaded Normandy, Omaha Beach, followed the, uh, the uh, Ranger, 2nd Ranger Battalion in, so we were the first ones on the beach actually. And a sergeant, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, the only Jewish fellow in my company, uh, he got hit by bullets the moment we hit the beach. He said, don't worry, Tex, I'll get you up the beach. It's a walk in the park. It's the first time I'd heard that too. So he got, he got shredded, he got shot by you know, a dozen bullets entered his body. He was dead. I lay down in back of him and heard the bullets thud into him. And uh, when they stopped to reload, during the silence, I got up and took off 
for the the hill which was about 50 feet high of sand where the Germans were in pillboxes and uh, there were sand traps and barbed wire and landmines so I was damn lucky to get up there and uh, a uh, a company of engineers had put a bunch of uh, TNT boxes in a, where the sand was the shallowest and they blew it up to smithereens and we went through there and uh, into where the Germans were and we killed them. We had fire blowers and machine guns and we were either kill or be killed yeah. and uh, it was a quick and quick or the dead told my guys to lay down and so the snipers wouldn't hit them and some of them got up and some of them got killed now you were in the 99th infantry division yeah Indian head at the time I was in the 99th Infantry Division, yeah. Headquarters Company, 393rd Infantry, and uh, we went up and we followed uh, we were transferred to the 29th Infantry because of our specialty, which was communications, which helped headquarters keep in touch with the rifle companies. So I was a switchboard operator and climbed telephone poles or trees to lay wire. Well, at age 18, I was pretty wiry, if you part the expression. Pretty good climbing trees. Mm -hmm. Of course, the trouble with that was, was uh, a sniper could get you up in a tree and they were, my buddy Bob uh, got uh, hit by a sniper when he was up a tree and I helped him down. The tree was icy and I helped him down. He came back six weeks later. But I, I went through that, the Battle of the Bulge even, pretty much unscathed. I'd like to go back a little bit if I could and, and have you, even in your basic training, what were some things that stood out, memories that stand out to you from basic? Well, the heat at Weatherford was terrible. It was uh, September and the whatever month it was, February, March, April. The heat was terrible. A lot of guys got heat prostration from carrying a 30 pound bag on their back and uh, it was rough. Uh, my introduction to the service was not very good. Yeah. There were a lot of sand fleas and uh, much heat and not enough water and uh, just desert. That's where we were. Yeah. Well, I know there had to have been a lot of discussion going on about where you were going to go. Well, there was speculation. Yeah. Of course, we had to go through basic. They shot bullets over our heads as we walked, as we went through barbed wire, and it was really rough on a lot of guys. A lot of guys were overweight, and they, they had a hard time making it. But we made it. So that, uh, can you take me through uh, that landing on Normandy? You're on the transport going in. I mean, what's going through your mind as you're... Well, I was on an LST, yeah. landing ship troops, and uh, there were landing ship troops behind us and in front of us. Some of them were hit directly by the shells and they went under and never got a chance to get on the beach. 
but fortunately our landing ship was uh, not hit. Some of the guys had convulsions. They were throwing up. They were so nervous. Uh, but the sergeant said, let's go. Let's get ready, man. So we locked and loaded and they let us off in about a, a foot or two of water and we slogged up the beach and uh, that's where my sergeant got hit. He lay there in a pool of blood. Mm -hmm. The blood, in fact, the, the froth of the waves carried that were red from the blood of the soldiers who were trying to get on the beach. So you said you advance, you cleaned out a German pillbox? Yeah, that's the first thing we did. Clean out a German pillbox. Some of the Germans tried to escape. They came out of the pillbox and we shot them. That was my first experience with shooting a German. It's a long way from Austin, Texas. A long way from reality. Yeah. It was reality. Yeah. Life or death. We thought we were ready until we landed and ended up in Belgium near uh, little town from close to Aachen and uh, that's where we they hit us with the Battle of the Bulge. I look up one morning and got out of my tent about daybreak and someone was shooting at us. It was two German tanks, big tanks. They were shooting at the trees above our heads and the trees the limbs just lopped off from the shells, and uh, that was the first we knew that there was a battle of the bulge. Mm -hmm. I got hit with a little piece of shrapnel in the chest, and uh, my major, their regimental commander, he got hit in the leg, and I had to half carry him, half drag him back to the back to the OP uh, observation post mm -hmm. and uh, there was an aid station there and uh, we got him bandaged up and got my wounded healed up pretty quickly it coagulated it was so cold that my blood coagulated very quickly you were talking about you didn't know cold until you got to Belgium. Can you talk a little bit about the cold and the that conditions? Was the, that was the worst winter that they had had in 50 years. It didn't get below zero for a month. And we were living in foxholes, which got to be pretty wet because it was raining and or snowing and or sleeting. And uh, it was really miserable. My toes got so cold from the wet and the cold that I got trench foot, which means frozen toes. And when I, at the time they wanted to cut my toes off, I said, no, not, not this child. So they didn't, and I, fortunately, when it gets to be too cold, my feet bother me a little bit. But you still got your toes. Still got my toes. Yeah. When they say, I suspies, it means on your toes. I'm on my toes. So that was that was your first experience also with trench. With warfare. what? Trench warfare where you were digging into a position at the bowl. No, my first uh, experience was when we landed on the beach, we went through bushes and trees and things like that. And there were German behind. It seemed like every bush, we shot them as we went. They were using 14-year-old boys. That's how far down the list that they had gotten. They were using boys for to kill people. 
And so, uh, did you have any interaction with the French people while you were in France? Only when I was given a two-day leave from our encampment in Belgium. I took a Red Ball truck down to Paris and I met a beautiful French girl and uh, I was going to go up to her and said I'm a, I'm a lonely Texan in the service away far from home and loved ones. She spoke English. Her name was Charmaine as I remember. She says I'm, I speak English. She spoke five languages and she was reading a book as I approached her and we, we became good friends. Naturally, I fell in love with her. And when I got back, it started raining when I started to go back. It rained for two days and two nights. I couldn't get back. And I went back to uh, where we were encamped in Belgium. And I said, Sarge, I'm sorry I'm late, but it rained for two days and two nights. He said, what did you do? I said, well, I met a beautiful girl. Well, he liked that. He said, well, I ought to, I ought to get you for day WOL away without leave. But he said, I'll just take away your stripes. And uh, he did. And we were friends. That He was about 40 or 50, pretty old for me. But he was a grizzled old uh, sergeant. He was a uh, had five stripes, three above and two below, and he was the first sergeant. Nice guy. So did you adapt well to military life? Not a bit. Never did. Never did like it. Never did adapt to it. I did what I had to do, but I was uh, happiest when I was sent to the cook's tent. He had D bars, which were chocolate bars, which I enjoyed chocolate a whole bunch. And uh, I could get all I wanted to eat, peeled potatoes, but that was, at least nobody was shooting at me. Sounds pretty innocent, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I know morale, what was morale like during the battle for the Bulge? Well, we were pretty much uh, disabled, I must say. They shot uh, about a third of our regiment was taken out by German Germans capturing us or killing us. and it, Morale was pretty low, but we were desperate and we fought them all mm -hmm. at uh, the town where we were. I forget the name of it even. Have you been back? No. Yeah. Not to Belgium. Yeah. I've been to Israel, Morocco, Spain, Italy, England, but not, <clears throat> not to uh, to France. Uh, I went to took my wife to France. <clears throat> She'd never been to Paris. I took her to Paris for her 50th anniversary and we enjoyed the heck out of that. Mm. Climbed the Eiffel Tower. It was a wonderful experience. A very romantic city, especially on our 50th anniversary. Yes, I would imagine so. Well, it's hard to imagine. Being in love with a woman for 50 years. That's a special woman. But uh, you are such a romantic to tell, as you hear the places that you've been to visit. So it makes sense that you go to Italy and Paris and Morocco, these sorts of places. You you got a you got a romantic spirit. Yep, I sure do. I write I write poetry, I write my children poetry, 
<clears throat> even to my son. I said, they said you couldn't do it, but you did it. He got to medical school, which was very hard for him because he went to uh, Monterey, Mexico, and the medical school, they taught only in Spanish. He had learned Spanish in six weeks, and he did. And he, he passed the course, speaks very, very Spanish very well. He's a smart fellow. I'm very proud of him. Yeah. He's a good man. I was his scoutmaster when he was a Boy Scout, and he got to be an Eagle Scout. I was very proud of that. His mother and his grandmother presented him with the Eagle Badge, and that's quite an accomplishment. Well, the, uh, we were talking about the Battle of the Bulge. When did you get a sense that the momentum was, you talked about how bad morale was, when things started to change. We were at Malmody, is the name of the town, in Belgium. And uh, we fought off the German guys in their tanks and their automobiles and uh, fought them off with an overwhelming show of ammunition and desperation. It was either live or die. A lot of guys died defending our flag, mm -hmm. but we defended it. Well, I know you were a communications specialist. Were you able to maintain good communications? Not at that time. Not at that time. Yeah. Communications were shot to heck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was no way to lay wire in that mess. Had to depend on walkie-talkies, which had just come into being, and they were not terribly dependable. So once y'all um, moved forward from that position in Belgium, where where did the 99th go? Well, they had broken us up so much that we were sent to a replacement depot, depot called a Rebel Depot. And I was transferred to the second infantry division, the Indian head division. And uh, I remain a communications expert. And we were sent uh, with Patton's ferocity. We fought our way into Frankfurt on Main and down through Aschaffensburg and on down to Bavaria which you read. Mm -hmm. So, it's a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. yeah, what were your impressions of the country once you got into Germany? Well, it was very green. They grew a lot of trees there. And uh, had beautiful highways. Autobahns are beautiful. You can go 100 miles an hour. There's no speed limit. Well, I would love to hear you. Uh, this story that you shared with me, I would love to hear you share it uh, in your own words so we can record it, if, if you wouldn't mind uh, talking a little bit about. You can begin with the Jeep ride that you describe here with your friends. Well, you want me to tell you that it was a beautiful for a ride. We were atop the Bavarian mountains and looking down at little villages which gleamed in the sun. People were sweeping up the cobblestones and we were told to go down and check on a little town near München, Munich, uh, called Dachau. And uh, we were on our way to Dachau to find out what was going on there. And uh, we got there, and the first thing we saw when we got to that that cow was a sign over the entrance which says, uh, work will make you free. Arbit mach frei. So 
we went through the gate there with three about three dozen cabins. They held about fifty men each, I guess, and uh, some trucks and uh, some places we felt were gas houses where people were gassed, and uh, we shot a few Germans on their way, they were escaping. I had by that time, I'd confiscated a Tommy submachine gun, which is a powerful weapon, and I let them have it. All that I saw, to this day I still won't buy anything German, made in Germany. I hate them so badly, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm afraid they're going to do it again. Uh, I look, looked at the, at the prisoners and their striped garb, so filthy and decimated. Uh, one of them moved, and I went over to him and I said, uh, he said, Bist Ayyid, are you Jewish? And I said, Ich bin Ayyid, I am Jewish. And then I told him, Alles geht, Alles geht, I speak. A little, a little Yiddish, which is pig German, and uh, <clears throat> all is good, all is good, all is good, all is good, and I opened my sea ration, fed them a little soup, made a little soup for him, and he died two hours later in my arms, and I asked him what his name was, his minor nomen. He's Hermann Eche. My name is Herman too. So I had tears in my eyes and I cry every time I think about it. Mm -hmm. This poor guy, he was about 40 years old and weighed about 50 pounds, maybe. And that's how much he had been maltreated. That's a hell of a load for a young fella, 19 years old. It was uh, May of 1945, and we went, or late April, and uh, that was when we went to Dachau. Had no idea that people, there were so many people were in prison, uh, Pentecostal people, priests, uh, politicians, especially Jews, had it behind bars, behind barbed wire, uh, and treated like animals, worse than animals. There were beds there, with boards I might say, hard boards they slept on. They were so tired when they got through working them that they just collapsed. I figured, mm -hmm. so be it. It's a hard blow for a young fellow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, when they, when you were, when you got orders to go over to, to uh, Dachau, what were the, why were they sending you there, or what did they know about it then? Well, I was part of I and R intelligence and reconnaissance and they sent us down there to check and see what was going on. They knew about concentration camps but we didn't. So they they sent us to investigate what was going on as far as concentration camps was concerned. And we found out quickly. It's a horrible experience. We had been through four battles already and uh, we thought we were immune from being shocked, but that was quite a shock. Blew, blew my mind. Yeah. I had no idea such a thing existed. Do you remember the moment when you knew this was something different? Well, when I entered the concentration camp, I figured when they said, uh, Arbit mach frei, means work makes you free, I said, that's funny, that's odd, because it's not true. 
but they made the people believe it. Mm. And they, they gassed them, they killed them, mm. lots of them. Mm. And I kept thinking there's so many wonderful lives wasted. Uh, composers, artists, scientists were killed just because Hitler said we're, we're all, all non-Aryans, we want to kill them. Mm -hmm. And he was hell on wheels, non-Aryans. You're non-Aryan, you weren't. The perfect race. The Germans thought they were. He inculcated that in them. Come us. Have any other questions? I do, I do. I just, you know, it, it's hard to imagine what you saw and what you experienced. I didn't believe it myself. Yeah. That's why I didn't talk about it for 40 years. Yeah. <clears throat> Ruthie will tell you, my wife, I just didn't mention it. Although my wife, my sister, she came home from a date one time when I was back in the States. She came in the front door and I was dreaming that the Germans were invading. I had a P-38 cocked and ready and she walked through the door. I was about to shoot her. I was really far clumped. And Jewish that means I was disorganized. So he says, stop, Hank, don't. You know, it was dark. Mm -hmm. It was about one o'clock. I'd been sleeping, and the Germans were after me. Well, um, when you got to the camp, uh, were there other troop, U.S. troops there? It's just we, at the moment, were there. The uh, 7th Infantry came later, a little later. But uh, they were, they freed the camp, literally. We were the first ones in. Were there, was there still a, a, a German, as far as military? There were some, a contingent of Germans, and we shot them, all that we could see. Mm -hmm. How much resistance was there that was still there? At the they camp? were fleeing. We shot them as they ran. So you mentioned uh, you, you stayed with Herman for this period of time and, and comforted him, and then, then what did you do in the camp? Well, by then it was, ready, it was getting dark. We were ready to leave, so we took off for Munich and uh, joined our fellows in Munich, what there was of them, as I remember. Did you, um, while you were there that afternoon that you were there, you did get a chance to look around? Yes, we did, as I said. We saw, saw about three dozen barracks and a few automobiles and uh, gas chambers. And we knew what they were for. There were people lying in the gas chambers, dead. and. Uh, they had a, a, a ravine, ravine there, and they had piled the bodies in the ravine and put lye on them. So it was rather horrible. Yeah, we had been through a hell of a lot, and then we had to go through that. Yeah. How much can one take? But as you said, it's very different than a battlefield. Very different. We're very proud to have uh, killed the Germans as they were leaving because they were the promulgators of much torture. Mm -hmm. And how can one man be that way to turn another man and call himself a, a human being? It's more of an animal than a human being. 
Well, once you rejoined your group in uh, Munich, do you remember how you explained what you saw to them? I told them about uh, the concentration camp, how we had found it with the barbed wire around it and a, a ditch with water in it to keep people from getting out. And uh, from there we went to uh, Czechoslovakia to Rocket Sani near the Austrian border. Is that where you heard the news of surrender? Yes, on May the 8th at Rocket Sani near Pilsen. Good beer. Did you drink some Pilsen beer that day? Yeah. It was hot. And I got drunk. You know, half a, I don't drink beer, but half, drank a half a bottle and that, that shook me up. I don't drink to this day. That was a happy day, though. Sure was. Yeah. Happy to be with my men and happy to join the Russians who were comrades at the moment. Yeah, talk a little bit about meeting the Russians. Well, we met the Russians and learned a few Russian words like uh, Dobry Vecha, that's good afternoon, and uh, Comrade Yata Blue e Blue, I love you. I learned that from my mother, who spoke Russian. Mm -hmm. What was the uh, interaction with the Russians was very friendly. We were very friendly. Um, they had vodka to drink, and they loved to drink the Russians. And uh, there was old blood and guts with his. Pearl handle 45s, and he was uh, saying, "Give me enough tanks, and I'll, I'll go to Moscow." He hated the Russians, and uh, they took over Czechoslovakia, whether we liked it or not. Mm -hmm. What well, What was your impression of Patton? Braggadocia. He was on stage all the time. He enjoyed it very much. Should have been an actor, because that's the way he was. He didn't even know he was fooling himself. But he enjoyed being Charlemagne and Napoleon all rolled into one. He was uh, one of the wealthiest generals in his service. He was, came from a very wealthy family, and uh, he could afford anything. But he was a great leader. Mm -hmm. He sure helped out, I think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he loved to see his name in a paper. Patton does it again. Yeah, I've heard better to say that George C. Scott did a good job he did a good job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, he got a, an Oscar for it. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask about uh, the Dachau experience again. Did it change how you thought about what you were doing or the meaning of what you were doing that you were able to participate? Well, it was just part of the, uh, the war as far as I was concerned people being imprisoned. I knew people were imprisoned during a war that is POWs, and these are all POWs, except that it was deadly. They, they gassed them, they killed them. If they couldn't use them, they were shot or, or killed one way or the other. I felt bad because they would, had we arrived a day earlier, we may have saved a few lives, but we arrived when we did, and uh, that was that. Did you have any knowledge there that the, the camps, as you said, there were a variety of people in the camps, but that 
people of the Jewish faith were especially targeted with the camps. Did you know that? No. At the time? I had no idea. In fact, it was the first thing that we knew was when we entered the camp and we saw who was there. All kinds of people, gypsies, They'd had all their gypsy love gold and had, had everything confiscated from them that was gold that was worth anything. The Germans took everything. The real non-Aryans, the super race. It's like uh, our governor, Perry, thinks he's a member of the super race. Of course, we don't like him much. Well, the, uh, uh, so surrender occurs on the 8th. The party with the Russians is going on. I know you had to be homesick. Oh yeah, I was homesick all the time. Yeah. We, it was great news that, uh, that the <clears throat> Axis had crumbled and that uh, peace was declared. So where did you go after that? Went to Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. and they'd been chasing me all over trying to tell me about my father being ill and we went from there we went by truck to Le Havre in France Harbor and got on a ship and went back to Boston Miles Standish Camp Miles Standish <clears throat> now Fort Miles Standish right outside of Boston first thing I did was call my sister the Red Cross allowed us one phone call so I called my sister she said they buried dad three days ago which is bad news for me. I'd wanted to see him at least. And uh, I came home on sick leave and uh, was let out of the service in October, I think. After the Japanese surrender? Right. So did, you didn't have enough points at that point to get out? I did. You did have enough points? Yeah. I had a few decorations. Mm -hmm. What decorations did you have? Well, I had the Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. I had the Bronze Star. That's a lot of points. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few others. Your Purple Heart from your shrapnel yeah. injury that you had in Belgium? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They examined me when I brought the Major in. Any lasting problems with that? Nope. That injury? In fact, I'd had open heart surgery since then. And uh, just a lucky guy. Twice lucky, three times lucky. Married the most wonderful woman. Well, you're overly blessed. That's true. Made lots of money. Yeah. Put it away. Like I told my children, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. <laughs> and that's very important. Well, when we were talking earlier, you took over, uh, you took your father's place in the, was it a dry goods store or a pawn, sh pawn shop? I changed it into a pawn shop. Changed it into a pawn shop. Because the, our sergeant would uh, lend the guys five bucks on their watches, their service watches, and when they got paid two weeks later, they'd pay him back ten dollars. I said, that's a hell of a deal. So I said, I want to I want to end on that deal. So we went in the pawn shop business. Lending a dime at a time. And as you were telling me, it, it worked out for you. Well, in my ignorance, I was lucky. Whether to be lucky or to be smart, it's better to be lucky. And this was a, a business that your mother 
was involved in as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. She was a keystone. Mm -hmm. Are there some stories that, that stand out to you from your long career in, in the pollen business? Well, the one that my wife hates is the one in which a guy walked in and said, I want to borrow five bucks on my eye. I had a prosthetic eye, pulled it out of his head, he'd gotten it in the service, says, I want five dollars, I need a, need a bottle of wine. So I loaned him five dollars on the wine. So people came in later, he never did come back. People came in later and said, what's the strangest thing you ever took in? I pulled out the box with the eye in it, I said, here, and showed him the prosthetic eye. It was a beautiful brown eye with veins running through it. So we had some farmers come in and they had seen the eye and they were looking for a wedding set. And I told them, say, we're, we bought a wedding set, I give them the eye. So sure enough, they bought a wedding set, I gave them the eye and that was the last of that. That's a funny, funny story. Had a, it was a Saturday night, cold in Corpus, and when it's cold in Corpus, it's cold. It was pretty cold, and a man was standing on the corner, uh, Afro-American, with a bag of groceries he'd gotten from the HEB store two blocks up the street. When a Latin American guy came up behind him and slit his throat from ear to ear, well, he came in the store, and he was bleeding, and he's pointing to his neck. He was bleeding profusely. I sat him down in a chair and put a wet towel around his neck and called the ambulance. Ambulance came and got him. Six weeks later, a man walked in the store. It was Saturday night again. man walked in the store, and he, in a husky voice, he said, I want to thank you for saving my life in a husky voice, and there were stitches across his throat from ear to ear. Here was the guy who saved his life. And that was a strange thing that happened. But I've had lots of strange things happen. What's the best deal you ever made? Best deal I ever made was uh, a doctor friend of mine wanted a, wanted a buy a diamond for an engagement ring for his wife. So I sold him a, a beautiful teardrop shaped diamond, three and a half carats for $29,000. That was the best deal I ever made. The best deal I ever made really was I bought a, a Russian cut diamond, round diamond. It was two carats, but very shallow and I bought it for $1,500, which is very reasonable for a one and a half carat diamond. <clears throat> so I took in a, a ring from a guy with a bunch of half carats in it, five half carats, two and two and one, 50 pointer. So a guy walked in the store, says, I got a ring here, I want to dress it up. He was a, an oil, he sold leases, oil leases. And he wanted a good looking ring. I said, well, I'll be glad to help you make up a ring. So I took the one carrot, put it in the center of his horseshoe, and the half carrots on the sides of the horseshoe, charged him $12,000. So I made about 300% on that. So that's, you know, imagination works a good deal on, on the, in any business. Mm -hmm. So I imagine that. So I took my wife out for dinner that evening. <laughs> Told her to take, any, take anything she wanted. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to ask, um, you know, we had talked about what you knew was going on at the time there with the liberation, but as you look back on it, and I know you've thought about it a lot since then, what has it meant for you to know 
that that's part of your life story, that you participated and you were a liberator. Well, it made me very proud to be able to say that I helped liberate a, a, a concentration camp. It made me a little different from other people who did not have that privilege. So that's the way I felt about it. Felt very proud to have done it, to have held the guy in my arms until he passed away. See what war can do. Made me hate war. I'm a very peaceful guy anymore. Haven't killed anybody lately. There's no guarantee that I won't. I'll watch my step. I got a pistol ready. <laughs> Well, what's it been like for you to, because you made a decision at some point that you did want to talk about it and you did want your children to know. Can you talk about why you made that decision? Well, very few parents open up to their children. And I have four lovely kids that I adore. And uh, I wanted to know what their dad was like. So I wrote a, an autobiography of myself put a couple of poems of myself that I wrote, and uh, among other things, my whole life from inception, practically, and uh, <clears throat> sent each of them a copy so they would have a, a, a genuine assertion as to their fathers having been here. Hope you don't mind my using a big word. Now. I like that word. I'm gonna write it down. <laughs> but I have some bright children, and they're all normal, thank God. And that's the trouble with being an atheist. When they sneeze, you can't say "God bless you." I heard you. I heard you say "Thank God." Well, they're not atheists in foxholes. That's right. Well, I, I'll ask that question since you since you raised it. Um, through your faith, I mean, how did you think about that experience? Well, I wanted my children to be good people. So we joined Temple Bethel, uh, the Nay Israel Synagogue, when our son was very young, six years old. And through the temple, I saw so many of my friends who were faithful believers in God that I, uh, I became a believer, whether I wanted to or not, uh, being an agnostic all my life. I still innately, I'm a, you can write that down too, innately I believe in God. The God, a pantheistic God. You know what that is? Yes. Pantheism? Mm -hmm. It's a good word. It is a good word. Well, um, Mr. Joseph, I want to thank you for your service. And Robert and I both want to thank you for your service. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, is there something we should ask you about that we didn't get a chance to talk about? Well, I have a birthday next month. I'm going to be 86. And I've lived so long, so luckily, hope I make it. And my wife, too. She's my partner. I'm going to really depend on her whole bunch as the man of the house, since I can't do it anymore. Well, she's a good partner. She's in the other room listening to us right now. Every word. <laughs> she's a wonderful woman. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, come on. <laughs> All right, well, thank you again for sitting down with us. You know, you asked him when did he first start uh -huh. talking. When was he able to first start talking about the war and uh -huh. his experiences? 
And, you know, it just sort of happened nationwide um, because for years it wasn't a topic of discussion. And then I remember